Thank you all for joining us uh, for our um, college webinar. We have Rob Sense from EMSI and um, coming in to, ch uh, to chat with us and um, Daniel Fukushan from Kepler. So it's gonna run pretty similarly to yesterday. Rob Sense will speak for 15, 20 minutes followed by um, Daniel Fukushan, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, but with that, I will, I'll give Rob the microphone and mute myself. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Grace. And yeah, it's a pleasure to join you all. Um, I, what I'll do is talk a little bit about sort of the data behind uh, the liberal arts education and the, the value it can play uh, in your life, in your student's life, um, in the workforce. And so what I'll do um, is actually share my slides because seeing data is easier than talking about it. One second. Okay. All right. So as a little intro, I'm the innovation officer at a, essentially it's a, it's a small tech company, not too small. We're about 200 plus employees now based here in Moscow, Idaho. We are essentially 20 years old. And what we do is use data, particularly labor market data, to help connect people, education, and work. And what we, we're doing is pulling data from a lot of sources, so the government, from companies looking to hire people, and from the people themselves through their resumes and profiles to help three key sectors connect. We try to help higher education, build programs that are relevant, and to help students understand those programs. We work in the public sector to help people connect with work in different communities. And that's what a lot of the public sector organizations do. Think about like an economic development organization or a workforce board. Uh, those are typically government or local funded organizations that help connect people in work. And then finally we work with companies, really big companies that are always looking for talent. And so through this, we've gained a lot of insight about work and about the degrees that people get before they go to work and how, how all that interacts. And so I wanna present uh, some research that we've done to you so you can get a better grasp of sort of the value and potential of what you might be able to get at New St. Andrews. So what we did is we observed job activity across about a million professional profiles. So our company collects a lot of data from people's resumes and profiles. So we have about 130 million resumes and profiles across the country. And in this case, we did a research project where we looked at a million of them where we have a very clear three job progression. So we can see that they have a degree, we can see that they have a first, second, and third job. And so we used uh, as much cleaned up data around that as we could. And what we found, what we did is we took three different areas, non-applied degrees, like language philosophy and the show, I'm sorry, social sciences. And that really forms a lot of what we think about when we talk about the liberal arts. Then we took two somewhat applied areas, business and communication degrees. And then we took um, two really applied degrees, engineering and IT. And where MZ sits is we serve a lot of education providers and we know the criticism leveled against education a lot, right? I need to get a really applied degree and a lot of those sort of language, philosophy, English, social sciences, those soft degrees, those aren't really good in this day and age. So that's the argument that people have. And what we wanted to do is study, is that real? So do people who have a language or philosophy or a liberal arts degree, do they have poor outcomes compared to people who have highly applied degrees? And we also wanted to compare against that sort of middle category like the business degree. And here's what we found. Um, across the board, no matter what degree you had, the top results were most graduates go into sales, marketing, management, and business ops, business operations of some sort. So those are the most common outcomes across all degrees. We found that there's very little, um, well, degrees converge. So there wasn't necessarily as much specialization per degree as people think. Now there is, so like for instance, accounting majors tend to go into accounting jobs, nursing majors tend to go to nursing jobs, engineers tend to become engineers. But for the most part, 
we see a huge convergence in degrees towards work. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, the biggest themes we found in all of the degrees to work data were that people work in tactical communication, strategic communication, interpersonal oversight, and operational oversight. So the, the demand for those things were, is like what you see for tech jobs. So everybody knows things like software development, um, you know, those IT kind of jobs. Everybody knows that those are in demand, right? We see that on the news all the time. We hear about it. But what we also saw are those four areas, the communication roles and the management roles that I'm talking about have as much demand in the market as any tech job. So that, that's the second thing. And then 54% and of everyone we looked at went into one of those key business functions. 25% went into STEM and then 21% went into another category. This is how the data looks. So if we look at the, uh, these top two areas are language and philosophy grads and social science. And then, again, keep in mind, this is the outcomes of graduates from all institutions across the country. So small liberal arts programs all the way up to, you know, the big university programs. Um, that we crunched all that together. And so we, we said these two areas tend to go into these major business functions. But what's interesting, what you should note here is how it almost didn't matter what degree people had. This is the areas they ended up in. 54% of all graduates we looked at ended up in these major business functions, which again, tactical communication, strategic communication, operational oversight, and interpersonal oversight. And I'll flesh those out in a second, but that's pretty notable and that's pretty interesting to me. Um, this, the STEM area really dominates the national conversation. It dominates our education psyche. But again, this is actually the major result that most people end up in. So if we think about higher education today, uh, there's a few points that I want to draw out. Um, one of the things you should know too about our company is we, we actually literally, we're 220-ish people. We literally sit right across the street from New St. Andrews and we hire an equal amount of liberal arts graduates and uh, sort of your STEM graduates. We have as many liberal arts grads working in our math and science programs as we probably have uh, the, the STEM graduate and vice versa. We have a lot we have the STEM type graduates in our business operations. So what we find is the liberal arts student and the STEM student actually mix into our company quite well and provide value in all these places. And so what I, my exhortation here is, the first thing you need to think about when you think about post-secondary education is actually leaning into education that A, has a foundation and B, builds you and gives you a foundation you can build on. And what I mean by that first point, has a foundation. So much of what we see in post-secondary education today is about deconstruction. All right? I, I go to a lot of higher education conferences and there is a big sort of deconstruction element happening in a lot of higher education today. And what I see in New St. Andrews is the opposite. It has a foundation that, it, that has knowledge that has standards um, that Christ-centered education has a strong foundation that builds. Um, it's not deconstruction, it's the opposite. And then th the importance of that is the foundation gives you something that you can build on. Um, what we don't talk enough about is that, that when we think about what's happening in education today, because so much of what we see in education has moved away from its traditional footing, has moved away from that idea of the university, a single truth, moving towards knowledge and truth. We've moved away from it, so what has that done? Well, it's taken away that foundation, and so as a result, you have a lot of people entering the labor market without that principle. And so when you think about work and what you need to do in the market to be successful, the only thing you really can do to be truly successful in the labor market is to be somebody who can add value. And the way that you add value to a work environment, through, to a job, to an employer, to an economy, anything, is doing things that are in short supply, okay? So let's say everybody in the world learns how to code, but no one has 
these core aspects, like they're poor communicators, they're poor at verbal and written communication, they're poor at overall problem solving, they're not great critical thinkers, they're not great leaders, right? These, these are the things that are hard to find more and more in our economy. So what I would say is, you know, we see it in the data, the core aspects of the liberal arts education are extremely vital in the labor market. And so I, I would say it's liberal arts plus, right? You need to have that strong foundation that those companies need. Plus, now you can build on top of it. You can add some coding skills. You can add some finance skills. You can add all kinds of things to it. And it makes you a very irresistible person. And what I, I want to emphasize is every job posting we look at, every key role we look at needs these things. And they, everyone knows that tends to come from a, from a classically liberal um, education. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a second. The, the third thing here is be confident and solve problems. Um, classic liberal arts education is valuable. I'd say that a, a, a parent considering liberal education or a, a student considering classical education, like we're talking about today, needs to be more confident in it. You should always be confident in making a faithful choice about your education. It's never going to sort of bite you that that's the choice you made. Um, and when, when I talk about the value, there's that bigger value, your life value, which Daniel's gonna talk a little bit about. But what I would say just from a purely sort of dollars and cents point of view, these areas, strategic communication. So, you know, a, a liberal, a classic liberally trained student does well in strategic communications because of the things they're equipped with in their education at New St. Andrews. So they tend to thrive in these environments, strategic communications, which is marketing and public relations. They thrive in tactical communications, sales and customer service. They thrive in operational oversight, systems, operations and finance, and they thrive finally in interpersonal oversight management and HR. Okay. Final point here is that the education to work sort of continuum is nonlinear. Less than 30% of all the people who have a degree actually quote unquote work in their major. That's a very few people actually work in their major. Uh, doesn't matter what they get, what degree they get. There's very few people who actually work in their major long term. So that's a little bit of a misnomer that you have to major in something that's going to give you a good job. Uh, I think right now we think of it more in terms of get the skills, get the knowledge that's going to help you be successful in the market. And these things here, the communication, the problem solving, the critical thinking, and so on, are vital in the labor market. Um, I'll just prove the point a little bit more. I mentioned the idea that uh, these these skills manifest, this knowledge manifests in areas of like sales, marketing, business, finance, and management. If you look at their growth trends compared to IT, there they are tracking right with IT. And obviously because of what's happened in the economy over the past couple months, uh, some of these projections are changed, but I would still look at this and say, these things are important in the economy. Something like marketing, something like management continues to be important and will grow um, as, as the economy gets back, uh, back to work. So again, these are really key sectors to think about and that liberal education really translates to it. Uh, wages. So some people would say, you know, a liberal arts major cannot earn good money. Well, one of the problems with that kind of data is a, uh, the liberal arts major has such a huge array of, uh, of outcomes compared to an IT major. So if you just look at the IT major compared to a liberal arts major. Well, the liberal arts major has so, such a, you know, more diversity in terms of their outcome than the IT major. So you're averaging, you know, it's not a fair averaging technique essentially. But when I look at these key roles that liberal arts majors can go into, marketing, management, sales, and business financial analysts, again, they track right along with IT roles. So I might talk to a, a liberal arts student and say, while you're in college, let's think about the application of your, of your knowledge and skills to these key areas of the economy. That's how I would think about it. Not so much a liberal arts major earns less than an IT major. 
Let's think more in terms of application. Um, this is the point I've made about nonlinearity. This is the outcomes of language and philosophy graduates. Um, this is actually what they do for their first, second, and third job. Now, a lot of language philosophy graduates um, go in, at, they, they go into education and they stay there, right? And it makes sense. A lot of people like, you know, English majors and so on, they end up as teachers and they stay as teachers. And that's just fine. That's great. Um, but what's interesting here is when we look at the sort of the preponderance of everything else they do, um, what, what drew our attention was the growth in marketing over time. And so in their first job, it's the third most popular job. By the third job, it's the second most popular job that they have. Um, and then again, you see that there's the management, there's the business and financial analysis. Obviously, sales plays a big role here. So look at the nonlinearity and look at the sorts of roles that people go into and excel in and notice how these are all pretty in demand things in the economy. So again, if people say you can't get a good job, uh, I'd say, yes, you can. Uh, this is a comparison just looking at communications grads. So this is some one, one of the more applied degrees. And again, I just wanna draw out the nonlinearity and how similar a communication degree is to a liberal arts degree. They have very, very similar outcomes. Notice the sales, the marketing, notice the HR, the management. Very interesting how similar they actually are. And then just as a quick comparison to engineering and then I'll, I'll finish up. Obviously, engineering grads, we need good engineers, right? We need people to build really important things like bridges and airplanes. So they go into a lot of engineering and software, but then when you get below that, look at that. There's sales, there's even marketing, there's management. There's very common outcomes across a lot of different degrees, which I think it's important to know. So that's, um, that's my, my spiel. Um, Daniel, I can kick, kick it over to you and then we can do some questions at the end. Awesome. Okay. Thank Thanks, Rob. That, that was fantastic. Um, I, um, I'd like to just tell you really quickly about myself uh, because I would like to, um, people, Think about liberal arts and they often assume that liberal arts is going to be some sort of an education outcome as rob was showing that there's a lot uh, um, that's not always the case and i would love to see the if the vision for classical education is properly um, understood that will continue more and more so so in the early um, uh, in the early days of america anyone who went to college liberal arts was assumed um, liberal arts was the foundation for any professional degree and that's what we've lost today so there's a, a real sense in coming back I came to Moscow having been convinced and heard enough about uh, liberal arts and new, having visited New St. Andrews that I came for one year to get that I, um, foundation of liberal arts I wanted to do one year at New St. Andrews and then go to business school and actually get a degree by um, uh, Christmas of my freshman year, I realized that this is the education I wanted, um, and 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 degree. It became a degree too. But I and I didn't go to business school. Instead, I went. Um, I finished my degree at New St. Andrews. Um, so I want to uh, kind of uh, talk about uh, three things with for you. I, I don't have a presentation. I want to just. Uh, um, I, uh, I I'm. Uh, MZ is fantastic with their graphs. I wouldn't dare to try to compete. <laughs> yeah, but I'd like to make, uh, first of all, I wanna make a case for staying the course on classical education. And I'm gonna kind of go into more uh, what, what that means and, and why a lot of people don't. Um, then I'd like to talk about um, three traps, um, as I'd like to call them, of, of that the uh, government schools, uh, you might put it that way, or the SAT and ACT in particular, um, uh, tell about the nature of education and, and offer to uh, to um, uh, to high school students. And then I want to distinguish, and, and this will uh, ride a little bit on what uh, Rob said, the between a degree and an education, or between education and, and a diploma. So uh, let me talk a little bit about the. Um, about staying the course, about uh, classical education. Um, there have been, uh, I have talked to uh, classical students, and, and here I really am addressing uh, students who have, who have had some sort of a classical Christian education. Uh, and they will think about New St. Andrews, they would say, okay, I, I, like, um, I like what I see there, but I had a classical Christian education, basically been there, done that. And um, 
the, um, I would like to uh, encourage you to realize that the, the what you have in high school, if you have that attitude, you've missed part of the vision of what that high school was supposed to do. Um, I would get, I'd like to give two analogies. One is more general and one is uh, more classical, you might say. Um, it, uh, have it, saying that you, we've, you've had a classical education, which is your, you know, your first coat, um, it should be a taste. It's kind of like saying, I know grammar, I know words. Um, why would I need to learn how to write? I can read. Who needs to, and, and there's a sense in which you, you might even say, well, if I can read, I'm going to get through life just fine. But, um, but uh, going to college uh, and pursuing classical education in college is like taking everything you've learned there and applying it. Um, it's like learning, you've learned to write, now you learn to read. Um, an, another analogy would be like, if you've been classically educated, you probably have logic. And logic is good, logic is great. Um, but the, there is, uh, it's important to have logic, to know that, you know, to, to, to think in a straight line, to know how to think straight. Um, but it is a dangerous thing, and, and you may have seen this all, already as you've, as you've gone through school, to have logic without rhetoric. So logic is kind of the skeletons, um, and rhetoric is the meat on the bones. And, and I would con, uh, compare that to, um, uh, to, to classical education going on into, uh, uh, sec, uh, into to college. If, you, if you've had it in high school, you, it's, it's, you don't want to stop there. You want to, to build on that. Um, and so that's kind of a, a practical um, in terms of finishing the course, I like to view uh, education as K through 16. We have this arbitrary division of 12th grade um, uh, being like the end. And you go from, if you're in a school in particular, and it'll look a little different for homeschool, you go from having to often ask to use the restroom um, if in class to all your freedom, your housing, your your living across the country, you're in a completely different stage of life. And this this arbitrary well, 12th grade, 18, is often a pitfall for a lot of uh, uh, high school students who are going into adult life, um, prematurely leaving, um, going into the world, and they often aren't ready. This is a period of life that is really essential, and um, it's and that affects the, the you know your peers, um, the community you're in, preparation, even, even the spouse. I met my spouse at New St. Andrews. I'm not, it's not a guarantee, but, but this is a period of your life where you might want to be getting married and, um, uh, and, and thinking about your, your future. And when you are uh, going into uh, public universities, you're really on the defensive, especially at the beginning. It's really a wasted uh, period of time. Um, so uh, if, if you're doing catch up, so there's a, there's also that aspect of, um, trans, literal transition where um, you are um, uh, much of the first two years of college are considered remedial and uh, so what students will often do is they will clep out um, if they've had a good solid classical education they'll clep out of the first two years of college while that may be economical um, in terms of the you know getting that piece of paper and that'll kind of hit my uh, uh, third point <laughs> um, the what often happens is I've heard people um, talk about, it with, about how this really affects lives is that the thing they're best at will be the thing they clep out of, and so they're good at English, they're good at writing skills because they had a good classical education, and then they clep out of that and uh, and they skip their classes. And what they're doing is that they're missing the ability to actually dig deep on those subjects. Um, and so there have, I've heard of, of um, college counselors who have um, um, late into the college process, just you know, barely almost missed their, their ability to find out what their true love in life was because they had clepped out and they missed those college professors who were gonna inspire them. And there was one story of, a, of someone who had, um, uh, joined a class because the professor said, you're good at this and I really want you in my class. Would you do me a favor? She said, oh, she had clepped out and she ended up joining her class and realizing I'm meant to be a writer and she had clepped out. So be, I would like to warn a high schoolers about clepping. Cle if you're clepping out of classes, why are you attending college? I guess I would ask that. And, and, and if it's just for the piece of paper, I hope to dissuade you from that. That's my third point. <laughs> so my, my, the, the second thing I'd like to talk about is the kind of the three traps that are presented by the uh, the SAT um, and the ACT and just 
the government, um, the culture that the government education presents. Um, uh, and and, uh, and present you with an alternative. So this is a very practical question. You're ending, you're getting towards the end of high school. What do you do for college entrance exams? Um, and so there, um, I'll, go in, I'll walk through the kind of the three traps I've, I've, I've identified. The first one is the ideology trap. So, uh, and that is to say that workers are, that, that um, college is meant to create a, a, mem a beneficial member of society the idea that your work, your cogs in a machine, um, this, and they they lure you in with uh, scholarships. They tell you, you know, you, you have a full scholarship at this university. You did well in high school. Now come and uh, enter into this, um, uh, into this this our our system, our college system. We're going to make you go through all these steps, give you a degree at the end, and tell you, congratulations, you are an engineer. Congratulations, you are. And there's a real power, dangerous power. In the you are now Rob just showed how the you are you are an engineer you are a teacher it actually doesn't even match up with real life and a lot of people find themselves dis disillusioned and confused because they got a chemistry degree and they expected to be mixing chemicals and nope they're doing something else and but but that uh, that that uh, false promise of you are something you will be promise a job is, is a dangerous one and you want to watch out uh, watch out for that um, uh, connected to that is the um, is the idea that um, um, you know with the the K through 6 12 and then the college years um, are training you how to be rule followers and so this is a little bit more anecdotal there's a lot of articles out there and I'm not I can look uh, uh, send you some of the links if you have questions to, to back these up but um, I'd like to um, the, the 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 fruit the promise of, of a, uh, is often connected to being a, if you're a good student you will graduate with honors and get a degree but did you know that most CEOs are B plus averages and few valedictorians go on to be innovators and creators and leaders in society. And, and I want you to think about this in the broader picture. A valedictorian, and if you're a valedictorian, congratulations, that doesn't doom you, don't worry. <laughs> um, but a valedictorian is in one sense the, the school's teacher's pet, but the school's pet. It's like there's a sense in which it's someone who has learned to follow all the rules, who has marked all those boxes they've never missed school they've never you know they've done really well and and they they leave and life isn't like school and when life isn't like school they often it's and it's often those who have who have for various reasons not done great in school because they were working a side job who have uh, worked around who who didn't do well with the exams in certain ways because they their minds didn't think that way and so they they were um they, they, those who have who, who refused the mold are often the ones who go out and become innovators. Um, I, um, I'm to jump a little bit ahead to the alternative to the SAT or the ACT, which is the CLT. Um, I, I'm on the uh, board of academic advisors of the Classical Learning Test, um, and uh, one of the the uh, uh, fellow board members was um, telling how uh, was saying how. Uh, as they, as she was preparing her own daughter, a well classically educated, um, uh, bright student, to prepare for the SAT, they were going through the exams and 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 um, you know wanting to do well because of its entrance exam to college, and um, she was overthinking it to the point that, that during their training she had to tell them stop thinking, you're getting it wrong, react, just react. Your gut reaction is going to be good. If you think through it, you're going to get it wrong. There is a there's a, a a large degree of unlearning that has to happen due to the the agenda um, uh, that the that the that the CSET and the ACT have. Um, so I I want to uh, come back to that specifically about the CLT, but the um, um, so so ideology trap. Beware of the ideology. The second one is the um, uh, the degree trap. Um, degrees today are 
um, I don't want to say they're worthless, but they are getting more and more so. They've been devalued. Everyone's going to college. And therefore, if you have that piece of paper that says you have a BA, it is worth less today than it was even 10 years ago because of this, this, this uh, you know, everyone's a winner. The, the, uh, some of the ideology that's, that's, that's being put into education and making sure everyone goes to college. Um, so there is a, uh, uh, even Facebook, if I understood correctly, have dropped their requirement for a BA. Um, and almost any, um, uh, uh, any, um, any job that says that there's a BA required, that's, um, uh, these days, that is a soft thing. Now, there are, there are um, ways, there are degrees that do mount up on one another and, and are important to have. But generally speaking, that, that people like to see um, skills, they like to see education, and they like to see um, uh, um, experience more than they, they need, want to see that piece of paper. Uh, and a lot of uh, homeschoolers in particular, I've, I've found, feel like that degree is a validation of what they've been building. And, that's, and we often seek in college entrance exams and college itself validation for the, for the Christian choices we've done beforehand. Uh, instead of being confident, like uh, Rob was saying, in what we were choosing, um, and that, and it doesn't play out. That's a, that's a false uh, promise. There was a once an interview of seven of the great CEOs, um, Apple and Google were in, in there, um, I think Microsoft, and they said, would you prefer a college, um, uh, a college graduate to apply for a job who did, got good grades and graduated with honors or someone who dropped out of college, started a business and failed? And every single one of these CEOs responded, I want the one who dropped out of college and failed. Now, this may be an odd thing for me to say uh, uh, when I'm, I'm encouraging people to go to New St. Andrews, um, but, that's, and, but that's because of the difference between an education and a degree. The piece of paper, the degree, is not, um, is, it can be a false promise and that should not be the goal, should not be the gold uh, that, that you strive after when, when you... Um, um, when, when you're when you're considering a college, that that piece of paper, um, I thought I wanted a degree, and so I said I'll do a year at New St. Andrews and then go after the degree. It took me six months to realize no, this is the education I wanted. This is what will actually prepare me for life and allow me to um, to be a um, a the a leader, a creator, the kind of person who can uh, do things, not follow instructions. Um, so. The um, um, the third one is the training trap. So, having uh, having stripped um, colleges, having stripped the liberal arts out of their college, um, I'd like to just make a note here to say that universities still to this day can't be considered a university if they completely remove the liberal arts. It's that's a, a, a community college. That's a trade school. If you remove the liberal arts from college from a university completely, you lose the title. What they've done instead is that they've reduced it to a caricature, to a joke. So true education still has to technically have, that's what we call those uh, base classes that everyone cleps out of, that skips if they can. The, that's that um, rep bare, unrecognizable remnant of a true liberal arts education. Um, and so what's, what's, um, what they've done instead is that they've inserted um, training into college. But I'd like to make the case that training is the, uh, college is the wrong place for training. Training is, is something you'll learn on the job. Training is what you do with a liberal arts education. Training is what you can do. You know, so many people say, uh, I went, my college was YouTube. I've actually, <laughs> you know, people are like, where did you, did you go to film school? You started a media business. Like, no, I got a liberal arts education and then I went to YouTube. You know, <laughs> you can learn training on the job. You can learn training from internships, uh, apprenticeships, um, forums, books. Um, and if you're building those on a liberal arts education, that's what, edu that's what real education is, and that's what university used to be for um, until fairly recently. Um, so, the, uh, so those are kind of the three traps. The ideology trap, what is education for? Um, the degree trap, if you're just going for that piece of paper, you'll be disappointed. It won't open the doors you think it will open. And then the training trap, 
training uh, college is not for training. Um, it's, it, it is a, it is for giving you those soft skills, those tools to learn how to, uh, to, to educate yourself, to learn, uh, who you are, what you are, who your people are, where you're going, <laughs> where you want to go, whether you should go there. Those questions that will actually have a practical implication in your, your life uh, for the rest of your life. Um, and so just to kind of, um, finish, I, I, um, the just I want to emphasize that education versus degree. Um, you want to um, uh, uh, you want an education that will allow you to, um, to go back to some of what uh, Rob was saying. Um, uh, that will allow you to um, build upon those base those base skills you have. So if every there will be periods where everyone has the same skill. But those who have those soft skills, those leadership skills, those in those critical thinking skills, um, critical thinking is 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 often a, a popular term in in today's STEM world. But critical thinking in in the in the more biblical sense of of uh, thinking about um, uh, the world the right way and thinking uh, logically along with rhetoric, the well uh, the um, embodied uh, truth, you might say. Um, so there is a um, I'd like to kind of close this with a quote from that you will not hear passed around in a lot of these. You will not hear this in uh, um, um, uh, uh, at main universities. You will not hear this in uh, a lot of even Christian circles. It's from someone who is not a Christian, who lived not that long ago, and who represented the. Um, uh, what was very recently, um, uh, well, was a is a classical perspective, but from uh, a public university. So, Dr. Frederick J. Kelly was the president of the University of Idaho in 1928, and so this is maybe a surprising person for me to be quoting here, um, but he gave a rather great description of what college is for. And he was actually kicked out. And I, before I read the quote, I want to give a little bit um, more context here. And um, actually, I just realized I did not, this is why slides would have been nice. <laughs> I did not tell about that alternative to the, to the SAT. And this will, will, will um, uh, tie in. The, there is uh, the, the CLT, the classical learning test, as it was started about four years ago and is a classical alternative to the SAT. Um, that I would uh, very much encourage you to look into because, you know, I mentioned those three traps of the SAT. Basically, they counteract all three of those. Um, it is a represents a classical education. The preparation for the CLT, the best preparation would be a classical education in high school. Um, you don't cram for it. You don't unlearn you don't, you, you, it, it repre, it, you, they will use the education you've received as a uh, classical um, student in, in high school. So there is some preparation you can do it for it. They've got a little guide, but it's not a, um, it is a, a growing college exam um, in the wake of uh, SAT's failures. I believe it's going to become a mainstream exam uh, before long. Um, the SAT was just this week dropped as a requirement in uh, certain schools in California. And uh, part of the reason is that they don't distinct, they are not helpful to admissions. Um, SAT has, has become such an agenda, uh, a tool for the liberal agenda, that they are, um, this, that colleges don't even find them useful anymore. So the CLT exam is standing out um, in that way. And I highly commend, I said, Grace just put a, um, a link to the CLT exam. Uh, so I, I really do encourage you to to look at that. Um, but I, I contributed a chapter to um, a book called A Better Admissions Test, which was basically the um, um, defense of the CLT when it was being founded. Uh, and one of the, uh, during my research there, I found Frederick J. Kelly, uh, who was one of the cre uh, creators of the SAT. Um, my chapter was about the history. How did we get here? What's the history of the SAT? And uh, I was, as I was tracking down sources of how this came about, I ended up in the special archives of the University of Idaho here in Moscow. 
Um, re, uh, because Frederick Kelly was one of the people who developed the bubble test who did, in 1915 after, um, um, uh, during World War I um, is when we started to have standardized testing and it became mainstream the week after Pearl Harbor was bombed. In other words, it was necessity that that uh, war, a wartime necessity that uh, brought us what we know today as the SAT. And then of course it became permanent. But he was in favor of that. He was one of the, uh, the people who contributed to the creation of the SAT and then realized where it was going and spent the rest of his life trying to undo it. And that didn't make him too popular. He was, uh, he became university, uh, president of the University of Idaho and only lasted two years because, because he believed that education was not about um, job training. So I'm going to read a, um, I'm actually, you can read along with me. I'm going to um, kind of just, um, I'm going to post this in the, is it going to let me post it? It may not. Nope. Okay. I'm just going to read it. <laughs> so uh, this is slightly older English, so that's why I was going to have you read along. I don't know why it's not letting me uh, paste it. Oh, well. Um, education is a lifelong process. How well any of us become educated does not depend essentially on how much uh, he comes to know in his school and college years, but rather upon how effectively he has come to be imbued with the spirit of study in school and college years so as to, to assure his remaining a student throughout life. It is amazing how general the notion seems to be that we study only when we have teachers who require it. Learning is the result of study. Teaching is not a substitute for learning, but is only a stimulus to it. Teaching, then, should be confined to those fundamentals which serve best as a basis for subsequent learning. College days should not be wasted on those highly differentiated aspects of subjects, meaning specialization. Um, the mastery of which will naturally follow if genuine intellectual interests are created and stimulated during college years. College is a place to learn how to educate oneself rather than a place in which to be educated. So, President of the University of Idaho, you could take that uh, to your local public university and say, uh, well, as a, in 1928, here's what we thought, what happened? And a lot happened. This is not how people think today. What everything he stood for, uh, by the way, he continued on in the next paragraph. This was his uh, address to all of the university students and faculty, uh, the inaugural address as president of the University of Idaho. Um, and um, he goes on to say, Let's talk, let's talk about the STEM fields. For example, even in, in, no one believes that you can graduate with an engineering degree and then be put in charge of a hydroelectric dam. Who would do that? You know, that would be a very dangerous thing to do. You don't, you, you, there's always job learning. He said, even in the STEM fields, learn those fundamental aspects of it. Learn those uh, uh, foundational aspects, those, uh, um, those the soft skills relating to, to those fields, um, rather than, uh, and then apprenticeship, on-job training, um, learning alongside people in the trade is where you're actually going to learn how to do the things you need to do. Um, and so what often happens when we don't do this is that we graduate from college with a specialized degree you, you are a computer programmer, congratulations, you know how to code, and, or, or um, you know, some other specialized degree, and you are um, promoted to your highest level of competency. In other words, you do well, and, and then you, you, um, you get a promotion, and suddenly they're like, you're doing really well, let's give you two employees. Suddenly you're not coding, you're dealing with employees and reports, and people skills and rhetoric and presentations and all these things that um, uh, the, that your degree in coding and coding you know when I was learning JavaScript I wasn't learning how to talk to other people instead of turning it the other way around learning those fundamentals of how those soft skills of how to um, uh, who you are as someone what matters what to build um, uh, and and then learning how to code learning how to, you know, I'm just using coding since uh, MZ needs those as well. Um, but uh, um, th so the encouragement here is to um, 
to, to when you're thinking about college and New St. Andrews is, does this in a wonderful way. I commend New St. Andrews to you and perfect as an alumni, but also um, uh, as someone who has seen the fruit of, of so many um, uh, students from New St. Andrews. Um, but, but wherever you go to college, uh, think, don't seek the job training. Um, uh, the skills are, that's not where you're going to be learning the skills. So um, uh, uh, to kind of recap there, um, stay the course. It's worth staying the course. Be aware of this, the, the lures that the SAT puts out uh, or the government schools and seek an education, not a degree. So I'd love to have questions if you have any for me or for Rob. Um, thanks so much for listening. Thanks, Daniel. Attendees, if you'd like to submit questions at the bottom bar of the um, screen here, there's a Q&A um, feature. While people are thinking about questions, I um, was talking to Rob before this meeting and we were talking about internships um, Rob, would you mind um, repeating some of that? I thought I thought you had some really interesting points. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, if you think about the way that a lot of colleges and universities work today, uh, that you know they focus on the degree. You know, it doesn't matter what area it is, English all the way over to engineering. But what a lot of those professors are doing is also working to. Um, get those students internships. And it, the internship is really the, uh, the, if you're concerned about getting a job, that's one of the things that most students are using to actually get jobs. The degree is a uh, proxy for education, you know, for knowledge. So when you upload your resume to a company who's looking for people, they're filtering you, does this person have a degree? In many cases, they, you know, if you have an English degree or, or an engineering degree, it's not as important. Obviously, if you're applying for an engineering job, you need the engineering degree. But what they're doing is looking for a proxy for knowledge. And then if they can see you, uh, that's why the internship's important. It's a, it's a working interview. So I think that if you do a liberal arts education and focus your student on a really good internship, it's a really good way to think about work versus just, I need a specific degree in a specific subject matter to be successful. And Rob, you know, you saying that a degree is a proxy for education, I, I agree. And, uh, and, and that is the, the, that proxy is what I feel is being increasingly devalued. So yeah. you need a higher degree to, to, for that proxy to mean something. Yeah. The problem, I think the thing is, because we're in a knowledge-based economy, the degree is more and more a requirement. I, I think that you could argue that it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's devalued, it's just more common, right? Um, it's more common today. It doesn't mean it's devalued. The knowledge work that dominates the United States tends to require some sort of bachelor's or above, um, you know, just, just to get your foot in the door. They want to see that you've done that. And it's true that Facebook and a lot of tech companies have dropped those requirements, but I think that's still a little bit of a, um, that's a little bit of a public relations signal. I, those like, you know, a top person at Google or Facebook, I can guarantee you probably came from Stanford or Harvard. Um, and Liberal they, arts school. They value those, those degrees. But also say that I would say that most people in, in public education, really do fundamentally believe in education for the sake of education. I, that's a massive debate in, you know, most universities. Is this job training or is this truly education? And, um, and the, the, the trick that they, I think they fall into is that the foundation has been so changed and eroded that they don't quite know where to go with that. Um, but I'd say most, most people in the university system believe that their job is truly to educate people. Um, not, they're not great job trainers. Now, again, a nursing degree, you know, a welding program, those are really important. Um, you know, we need all those things. I think it's the way what I would look at the economy is it's like a functioning body. We have 
a lot of different roles and things to play. And I'd say that the liberal arts student has a massive and important role to play, given all the things that are happening in the economy today. We need all of it. Um, and, and so I just wouldn't shy away from, I wouldn't actually encourage more people to think about you know, a classical liberal education today. It's really important. Right. Right. I, I, I don't want, I was not indicating that we shouldn't get degrees. <laughs> it was that the, that, that uh, paper will not get you as far if you're just looking for a paper. Yes. Um, so, and of course there are a lot of people in education who still believe in it, but uh, you know, so many people can just, you know, do it online university, get, get, go through the steps, get that piece of paper and believe that it will open doors that it actually won't open. Um, absolutely, uh, there are, um, uh, if you look at the, the political scene, Trump is an anomaly. Uh, most of most presidents ha went to prestigious schools, um, had those skills in, um, in school that allowed them to do what, what, what they did in life. And that included both um, uh, connections, but also those, um, uh, um, those liberal arts schools, because in the past, all those Ivy League schools still retain a good bit of the liberal arts, yeah. um, and in the past did so even more. Yep, absolutely. Awesome. We have a question here. Do you have any comments or personal experiences to share on advantage, advantages, disadvantages of going to a small liberal arts school such as NSA. Um, let's see, Daniel, do you want to take a stab at that one as a NSA graduate? Um, I can also, sure. but yeah. Sure, yeah, so um, the, uh, a, a, few, a few of the advantages, um, there's a lot that could be said here. <laughs> um, uh, a few of the advantages are the, um, the small student, teacher student ratio, just in terms of the actual educational experience. Um, the, there's, you have uh, Nushin Andrews in particular um, has the, um, uh, 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 the Oxford approach of uh, lecture and recitations. So you might have a lecture with uh, Dr. Chris Schlecht on Tuesday and then meet with him in a small group of 10 or less on Friday. Um, where you have recitations, basically a group where you, where you, you, you basically have the lecture and then you work through the material, you have a presentation, you talk in a small group. Um, those are the kinds of things that are possible in a small liberal arts uh, context. Um, the, the other, uh, um, another benefit is you actually get to know the school body, not just your class. Um, and this is where a very small school comes into play. You actually get to know uh, seniors and uh, have interaction, the staff are interacting with not just their students in freshman year, but students across the board. And that has a lot of value um, The and uh, counteracts one of the weaknesses. So one of the weaknesses of such a small school is that when you have a huge alumni base, when you have a, um, uh, um, a large school, they can do more of the um, introductions, connections um, to um, uh, um, opportunities, various opportunities. Um, and so a smaller alumni base, a smaller school will make that more um, personalized, but also those resources aren't as big. So there are pros and cons. Um, and and uh, for example, Lucian Andrews has a special connection to MZ because it's a small town. They need good people to work for them. And so there's a, a, um, a good chance you can um, have a chance at working at MZ or a connection to MZ, at least an opportunity to, to work there. Um, uh, uh, and a larger university would have more of those in a more broad, uh, broad sense. Um, but yeah, th those are just a few things. The personalized education, I think, is the, the most important one there um, of having a small teacher-student ratio. Rob, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, uh, past few weeks have taught us it's in Idaho and it's open. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Idaho is uh, one of the fastest growing states. So yeah, well, it's, um, also, it's also uh, a lot more stable uh, what, from what we've seen from the past few weeks. And what I think what's important there too is uh, sort of a stable community is a really important to think about 
when you think about education for the next few years. Um, you don't know, you know, what some of these schools are going to be doing. And uh, I think if, you know, I think we have a, a more intact system with a small school that can really serve and um, minister and just be part of a community. Um, you know, you just, we have a lot of uncertainty right now. And I, 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 again, for my kids, I would send them and that I have two in high school right now. They were both, we're planning on sending both of them to New St. Andrews. A, because I believe in the community that's there. So that's most important to me. B is I think the things they'd learn would stay intact and they would learn them more consistently for four years versus other places. The New St. Andrews education um, is tried and true because it's actually, uh, um, uh, because they're going after true education and not job training that does change, the needs, the needs change, um, but it's not fundamentally different than the education that students were receiving at Harvard in the late 1600s. A lot of it, you will learn a lot of the same things um, that prepared uh, past presidents and the leaders and creators of our country in the 1600s and 1700s. What prepared them to do what they needed to do has not, uh, is still what you're being taught at New St. Andrews. And that's not specifically a small versus sm uh, large school. That's more of a philosophical um, uh, education versus uh, mere degree, um, a true education uh, comment. Did that answer the question? Awesome. We have time probably for one more question, uh, or we might just wrap it up here. I, I think uh, on this, I'll just jump in probably as the moderator, I'm not supposed to, but uh, <laughs> on the idea of a small school, I think it's also important to really do your homework. Um, size does not guarantee personalization. I think at New St. Andrews, that is a very, it, that's a critical and crucial part of our education down to the way that we do finals. Um, many of our finals are oral finals, oral finals. So it's students signing up for 15 to 45 minute slots one-on-one -on -one with a professor. Um, but yeah. What, and I can tell you that those were very scary. That was a very scary prospect my freshman year but I came to, it came to be a highlight of every term because it was a time where I sat down with my professors and we, it wasn't 45 minutes of pure exam. We talked about, uh, it was a time of catch up and a personal time with one-on-one -on -one with our professor. Um, and and, and um, it, it was, it actually allowed a far more personalized and accurate view of, of how you're doing, um, which, benefited you whether you were prepared or not. You can take my word for it. Awesome. Or times I was both. <laughs> well, thank you attendees for joining us. Thanks, Rob and Daniel. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. It looks like the sun's finally come out um, yeah. here in Northern Idaho. <laughs> That's right. Things are growing. <laughs> All right. Have a great. Thanks for having me.